Hello, everyone. This is uh, Dana Naksho. I'm the director of Duquesne Klein Law Library, and it is my privilege and honor to be here with Professor Marisa Meredith. And uh, this is another um, legal talk series, faculty scholarship in 10 questions. And um, in 2020, that's how far away, Professor Meredith came to Pittsburgh. Yes, I did. And um, since then, she's done so much. It's on, It's barely three years and a half. So I'm going to mention just some of her talks. For example, the talks that she had with um, the American Bar Association, Prison Litigation Reform Act, or addressing the constraints of the Fourth Amendment. And after that, we have more presentations, Tinder love and care, discussion of online dating apps, failure to provide effective safety pre precautions for users. And that was uh, in Florida, but you are not a real law professor. And um, that was in June 21 at the Biennial Conference, University of Michigan Law School. We have a legal writing plus teaching subjects beyond legal writing. And this is another biennial at the New York Law School. And on this point, I would like to add that um, Professor Meredith is outspoken when it comes to citing manuals. And she is, I think, right when she says that the Blue Book is mostly for academic writing and not for practitioners. Yeah. And uh, here we are with, in September 10, 2021, we had an article out with the old and with the new signed by Professor Meredith. And if this is not enough, in a very <laughs> prestigious um, law review at Indiana Law Review, we're talking a very recent article, Tinder Love and Care, proposing an industry self-regulation policy implementing safety procedures for dating app companies. And now I'm going to try to connect that with some aspects from her education. And I mean the project lead that she was conducting at North Carolina, helping the elderly. Oh, yeah. Do you think that something, that desire to impose justice for all brought you to, to this new article who is trying to regulate something that's almost unregulable, correct? Yes. Dating apps where, sincerely, I really want to say that I'm a princess. But before we go there, please, let's start with the number one question. In addition to what I said, how would you like to introduce yourself? And uh, may I say Marisa? Yes. Thank you. So what I will say is you did a wonderful job introducing <laughs> me and I need to have you at all conferences everywhere I present <laughs> because yes. you just did a wonderful job <laughs> making me sound phenomenal. You are um, phenomenal. I didn't even remember. Really, so I didn't, didn't even remember that I did all those things you see? until you said it. Um, so just a little bit about my background. Yes. I'm originally from Richmond, Virginia. Um, I grew up with a mom who was a teacher. Um, she taught six, seven, eighth grade math and science. So uh, education was always a part of my upbringing, very much so education focused. Um, I think I was destined to be a professor due to the fact that education was such a stronghold in my family. And so then I went to William Mary undergrad. Um, there I worked with little kids. So again, working to nurture and grow people's mindsets. In the Avalon project or the street law project? So that one was just working at a little daycare, nurturing little kids and ensuring that they, you know, mosey along and did everything they were supposed to do. But when I went to Central, which is in Durham, North Carolina, North Carolina Central School of Law, as we call it, the North Carolina Central School of Law, where our legal eagles soar, uh, I then got really engaged in like community activities. So I... As part of, before I went to law school, I was a paralegal. I worked at a law firm that um, is in Williamsburg, Virginia, Johnson, Gates, and Baxter. And they specialize in business um, planning as well as estate planning. And I got a little taste of like elder law, estate planning, working with them. And I thought like, oh, this is not really for me. And then I went to law school. And I'm like, no, actually, everything that I did as a paralegal, I actually really loved. So shout out to them because they don't actually <laughs> know that they inspired me to pursue a legal field that I was like, ah, I don't want to do it. But now <laughs> I'm all about it. 
And so when I got into law school and learned about estate planning, it just intrigued me. And especially since um, in America, at early population, teens tends to be like, I don't want to say forgotten, but forgotten, right? They still need protection and all those things. So when I was in law school, I was approached by our pro bono um, clinic director to work with her to run our elder law clinic. Now, our elder law clinic, we did two projects, one in the fall and one in the spring, where we just went to a community center located in the Raleigh-Durham area. And um, we had people call in to sign up. So, because it was in conjunction with Legal Aid in North Carolina. So people would come up, sign in, and then we had local attorneys come in and do healthcare power attorneys, uh, wills, and all these great things for the local community. And on top of that, every third Friday, I believe, we used to go to the um, senior center in Durham and do wills and healthcare power attorneys. Now, these are basics. These weren't the fancy ones that if you have a huge estate, you're getting, but at least that your bare minimal assets are covered, um, that your health care plans were thought about Mm -hmm. and those things. So we got those things done. So that was my first like, ah, I really love what I'm doing. I know I'm going to be a great attorney, hopefully, and um, that I knew I was on the right path in the right area of law because I loved it. Um, And then street law was just another passion. It combined my love for educating youth and giving back to the youth community with my legal passion. So street law, a group of me and my friends, uh, we volunteered for this pro pro bono project where we went into a local middle school. uh, I believe it was called Citizen School. And we worked with middle school age students that showed us, right, middle school age students to get them learning the ins and out of the criminal justice system. Not to the levels of a law student, of course, but enough that they could put on a mock trial at the end. So we worked with them, I believe, like 13 weeks to get them through like, hey, these are the, this is how you do a trial. These are the people who were a part of the trial. Um, I think a group of students actually created the, the hypo that we utilize. And then we had a mock trial at the law school. So they got to come to the law school and do their trial in our courtroom. So it was really, really cool for the students. And our professors also joined in and they played the judge. That's amazing. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. I think thinking about like that experience as well as being a tutor, I was a civil pro tutor, all kind of led me to where I'm in today. Like I love... I love the law, still have a passion for it, still like to practice from time to time, but I also like educating people and helping them, you know, get down the road to whatever goal they want. This is wonderful because what I see here is that not um, someone who cannot do teachers, but someone who excels are doing teachers. So thank you. Thank you. you. So we are moving along. As you see, this is a very animated um, uh, legal talk series, and uh, we are so, so happy to be here with um, Marisa. The second question, what inspires you to write? So what inspires me to write usually is something that has happened, right? So for my paper that got published with the Indiana Law Journal, the Tender Love and Care article, um, it was just a lot of my friends were on dating apps. Um, And then there were some random news articles. I believe at the time, some things were happening in like New York, where people were using the dating apps to set people up for robberies and things of that nature. And I wanted to see, you know, have they ever been sued? Really? Was there ever a time where a dating app had been successfully sued? And if so, did that lead to any safety measures? And that led me into this deep dive. I believe I don't want to get her name wrong, but there was a Match.com case where um, this woman went on a date through Match.com and uh, was assaulted after, I want to say, this a few dates with this man she was assaulted. And it came out that Match.com knew this man was assaulting people, assaulting women. They had gotten letters previously mm-hmm. from other people who he had done this to. And he was still using the app. 
So I believe uh, it's Ashley, our VP, Kamala Harris. Uh, she was the attorney general at that time for attorney general. You know, California? There. At Match.com had agreed to now do background checks. So it was this huge thing um, for kind of like regulating the dating app companies, right? And then fast forward to now, if you go on several of these dating sites, they explicitly say they do not do background checks. Right. Yeah. And their terms and conditions, they say we do not do background checks. So it's and, a disclaimer, the opposite. Yeah. So they made a disclaimer us. instead of saying, hey, we're going to do a background check on everybody. They gave a disclaimer like, yeah, we don't do it. Right. So that led to that one. My other things that I've written about are just things that piqued my interest, like um, my students coming to me and asking questions. And I've been like, yeah, that's a really good question for the citation manual. When one of my students was like, at Duquesne, we use the Allway Guide. And my students came to me and said, why don't we use the Blue Book? A lot of my colleagues at other institutions use the Blue Book. Frankly, when I was in law school, I used the Blue Absolutely. Book. Absolutely. Right? So I did a deep dive into the difference between the Blue Book, the Allway Guide, and a few other citations. And just noted that, one, generally speaking, they all get you to the same goal. Yes. Right? And two, the difference was... The law reviews really push the blue book because it's really for academic writing. And that is money out of it. It's this design too, right? The design of the blue book is for academic. Majority of the pages, the white pages, which are majority of the blue book, are for academics. Absolutely. Starly writing, right? And then you have those little 50 pages in the front that are for practitioners, right? Yes. And that even though say reference the white pages for more detail, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So once I did that deep dive, um, I think that in talking to uh, Professor Levine, that led to that paper being ready. So a lot of my things come from just day-to-day -day interactions with friends, family, my students, all those inspire me to write. And I'm like, oh yeah, that is a problem. Let's talk about it. That's wonderful. I think education is meant to deal with problems that bother us day-to-day yeah. -day, and you're doing it. So congratulations. Thank you. Moving along, who are your favorite legal writers? Yeah, so this is a tough question for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have so many that I love and that have inspired me. Um, my first two that I'm going to talk about are actually former colleagues of mine, um, Tiffany Atkins and Sarah Oaks. Um, me and Sarah met because we started in this business of being professors um, at Elon School of Law, and we were fellows there together. So she had my bag, I had hers. We were in the <laughs> trenches together learning how this professor thing worked, but she was just a phenomenal writer. And so when I came into this, this field, I knew nothing about scholarly writing outside of law school, right? I had been a practicing attorney for so long that I knew- How to write. I knew how to write- Legally yeah, and persuasively. Like briefs yes. and all those things, I got you. But when it came to writing like a scholarly article that was just on a random research topic, it was not my jam. So um, she was definitely an inspiration because she loved it. She had a focus, which was international law. And because of her focus, I learned so much because I would read her articles. I'm like, one, well thought out. Two, I didn't even know these things were happening. And she loves to talk about I know this sounds bad, but she loves to talk about atrocities that are being committed um, that need like the international courts to step in. And I think her art articles are phenomenal and should definitely be read. But uh, where is she now? We are giving her. She a shout out. is back at Elon. Shout out. She is Sarah. back at Elon. She is wonderful. Another shout out for Sarah. Not only is she a wonderful scholarly writer, she also just wrote a novel. Yes. It is available on Amazon. <laughs> it is called The Resort. I 100% recommend reading it. I think we're going to yeah. purchase it. And then on the, another note, my other colleague, Tiffany Atkins, she is wonderful. She took me under her wing. She had already done the fellowship program when I had gone, gotten to Elon. She went off to Wake Forest, came back to Elon um, my last year there. And she was just a wonderful wealth of knowledge of how to just be your authentic self in the classroom, right? I was new to practicing. I mean, new to being a professor. I did not know how to switch gears from courtroom 
Marissa to, you know, Professor Meredith, right? And so she allowed me to realize that it's okay to be your authentic self. You can wear the sneakers. You can wear whatever you want. You can, you know, you don't have to talk high level. No. You know, you can be who you want to be in the classroom. And it's better that you're your Absolutely. authentic self in the classroom. Because you create the bond in your students. And because of her, I think I started to become who I am today as a professor. And also start thinking about um, how, who I wanted to be as a professor and how I wanted to relate to my students. Um, if I may interject, yeah. every time I go and visit Marisa, she has at least two, three students. Yeah. So I know that you're very much loved. I've students. always wanted my office to be a place where students come, just hang out. Yes. I know I have work to do, so I'm usually working, but just a place where, you know, if they needed a moment, they could just come and sit down. They don't have to stay there. They don't have to talk to me. They can do their own work. But if they just need a moment, they had a place. So that's phenomenal. This is I what I it. try to create in this library. But are we think alive? Yeah. <laughs> so Tiffany and Tiffany Atkins and coupled with um, Renee Allen, coupled with Olymp Olympia Duhart are really like my legal writing idols. Um, Tiffany Jeffers as well. They really talk about uh, how the law impacts, you know, African-Americans um, and also building inclusivity into your classroom intentionally, not making it happen by accident, but intentionally having classrooms that are inclusive and thinking about the next generation, right? Um, Tiffany has this wonderful article called For the Culture. It specifically, it specifically talks about um, Gen Z and how Gen Z learns and what Gen Z wants from that legal education and how we can modify how we teach to meet their needs. And I think that is a we need wonderful so article. much more on that. Yeah. So at, these articles um, really help me because again, give you confidence to be who you are. They give me confidence to be who I am, but also help me see where my students are coming from, their Absolutely. thought process, their mindsets and how to shift my classroom, right? Um, I always tell my students that although some things are the same from year to year, my students aren't. So how do I teach them? How do I bring them up to speed to being great attorneys where they are? Please listen to what Marissa has to say because I think our legal, legal education needs so much to be more focused from year to year on what the students want, what the society needs at large because society changes with our each generation so i think those are just a few but generally speaking i have a lot of legal writing heroes that really talk about intentionally bringing inclusivity into the classroom um how to teach my area of, that i teach which is legal writing um effectively for the new generation of students and um just being like your authentic self in the classroom so I think those I'm are sorry, I didn't there. applaud anybody before here. So if um, some of the previous, you, you know, professors who were in Marissa's chair are watching it, I'm very sorry about what I hear here is revolutionary for the legal profession. So thank you, Marissa. No problem. So on this high yeah. note, note, we are going to try to keep it given even higher. The fourth question, what piece of your scholarship would you like to talk about today? All right, so I forgot I've done so many things <laughs> until you mentioned it in question one. Uh, so I believe the piece of scholarship that I would talk about today will be tender love and care. Perfect. Yes. Um, tender love and care really talks about how we got here. How did we get to online dating? So it begins with a brief history about, um, you know, this is not something that happened overnight. There Absolutely. were steps that led to online dating. And it's not really a new phenomenon. Exactly. Phenomenon, right? Exactly. Um, it really began with like the first step of this when we came to the States. Um, courtship was looked at differently, right? Your family was aware, your community was aware of who was courting you because they had to say in it. Because marriage was not like for love. What was that? <laughs> right? Marriage was a business arrangement, right? So the family and the community had a hand in that. 
And then we slowly moved away from that because America grew up. It wasn't rural. It wasn't these little townships. It became a booming industry. And so you had people moving to the big city from their little towns. And then how do you court, right? Absolutely. Well, introduction of the newspaper, right? The personal ads and Absolutely. all those things. So we had people placing personal ads and doing all the things that we now talk about, like catfishing. Just via snail mail, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Good old snail mail. So um, it briefly talks about that and how we got here today. And the thing that we lost along the way was awareness, right? So when your community was involved, when your family was involved in your partnership, they knew who they were putting you with. Um, they knew their family. They knew where you were. They knew all these things. So the but, background checking was done by the Yeah, by the, by the community. They were vetted. They were already, vetted, absolutely. Right? And then you slowly moved to personal ads where these people aren't vetted. You're just talking to them, right? Trying to get to know them, trying to build that relationship. Absolutely. And, but you're doing it with someone that you have never seen before. Huge risk. Yeah. And you're losing that awareness. And then we got to the modern age and we introduced computers to the mix. And now we fast forward, we introduce smartphones to the mix and you still have the same thing. People trying to know people, get to know them because they've either moved to a new city and want to meet people in a new city or are just looking for a courtship of some sort, exactly. right? And, but again, no one is aware of who you're talking to. You may not even be aware of who you're talking to, right? So I, I giggle because my students are like, why this? And I'm like, well, Catfish, the TV show, <laughs> came out, I want to say, early 2000s. And yet, till this day, where we have smartphones, we have FaceTime, we have Skype, we have Zoom, we have all the things where people can see who they're communing with across the universe. Still. Still people are being catfish <laughs> till this day. Absolutely. Right? So, scamming. All scamming. Exactly. And then that fast forwarded to, again, my deep dive into, well, all right, just because people are getting catfish, yeah, that is a horrible situation. You making a connection and then finding out that is a whole lot. But what has happened from that? Is it just like heartbreak because you met someone who isn't who they said who they were? Yeah. Or were there actual harm happening? And so I did a deep dive and I believe other pro um, professors at other institutions have also talked about this, um, like in World Wide Web of Lies, one of my favorite ones that I read. Um, you realize that no, people are plotting on how they're using dating apps. They are finding people who are isolated Absolutely. and making that person their significant other, marrying that person, having insurance schemes that they plan on murdering their significant other, um, financial scams. All these things are happening. And I, I went through again saying, okay, so I see the court cases where the person who has done the thing is being held accountable. They're going to jail. Um, civil suits are being had all these things, but the trend is, it's still going on. So why? So then my thought process was, okay, we're holding the person who actually did the violence or whatever accountable. I love that. But are we holding the dating platforms accountable? They're enabling it. Yes. So when I had this idea and I spoke about it with several friends and colleagues, they were like, well, think of it like this, Marissa. When you go to a bar, do you hold the bar accountable if something happens, right? Interesting. And so they analogize the situation to a bar. And sure, if it was a one-off, I get it, you know? Um, but my thought process is more like, okay, some of these dating apps take money exactly. from their um, patrons, their users, right? So they're taking money to allow you to utilize their platforms for this, these dates. Additionally, at some point, they've changed a few things because of safety reasons. But at some point, they were using geolocation. They still use geolocation, but you could see, like, hey, someone is within five miles of you, right? This is the last time a person used the app, right? There were things there that just made the apps a little icky, a little unsafe. And then on top of that, you get in these situations, they give you all these guidelines, like, you know, Meet in a public space. 
um, don't give your financial information, all these things. But then as we see today, the U.S. Embassy, um, I want to say January, December, issued a alert saying, hey, be careful in your travels to Colombia because people are utilizing dating apps to commit robberies. Absolutely. And so people are setting you up. They already plan for you to go to this bar and meet them. They already have set up um, the drink that they're going to use to drug you so they can rob you and all these things. So even those things that you think are keeping you safe aren't actually keeping you safe. So that was why this meant a lot to me. And so when I did my deep dive, what I realized is Section 230, which was a big deal because if y'all recall, um, I want to say 2020, 2021, um, President Trump was fed up with Twitter and their censorship of him. And they utilized, they were like, oh, Section 230 allows us to do it, right? We can censor you, we can ban you, we can do all the things because Section 230 allows it. And so Congress was taking up, should we tweak it? Should we fix it? What should we do about um, this clause? And to those that don't know, Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act essentially says that um, it protects these websites. Um, the conduits of the information. Yeah, conduits of information so that they can... Um, edit, take down things that are obscene, right? That is the real the term. Thought. Yeah, obscene things. No one knows what it means. No, it's you very, it's very broad. when you see it. Yeah, <laughs> how it's applied is very, very broadly. So in that situation, I started looking at it and I'm like, well, they're not trying to hold the websites accountable for what was said. They're saying, hey, you knew this person was a predator and you didn't take them down. That's negligence. Absolutely. Right. So the people aren't saying, hey, you're responsible for the words that lured me to no. this site. They're saying, hey, you were negligent and your negligence caused me harm. But even in those cases, if you look at them, Section 230 still protects them. And the big one that I saw was like a grinder case where an ex-boyfriend was just he took Petty to a whole nother level. He <laughs> utilized the app and weaponized it against his ex. And he sent people to his ex home and had people really just um, harassing this man. And I believe the individual let Grinder know in Nothing Section 230, right? So because I saw in my research that the legal means, like you would think Section 230 wouldn't have been an affirmative defense, but it was, um, the legal remedies were not really available to these people, I realized that really this is a PR. We have to take it for, uh, as a PR spin, right? And just as I was wondering, like, how do I fix the problem? Lo and behold, um, Uber and Lyft decided, hey, <laughs> let's do a partnership because they were having similar issues with their drivers, right? Absolutely. So it just kind of fell in my lap. I was like, what is the solution to this? And Uber and Lyft announced they're going to do a safety policy across platforms where they notify each other when, you know, if a driver was dismissed from their their app, then they would notify like the rationale to Lyft and Lyft can also do the same. Because usually if you're Absolutely. a driver for Lyft, you probably are a driver for Uber Ooh. and vice versa. So um, they created their safety plan. That's at least, true. yeah, at least that's what they told the public. And I was like, this is phenomenal. Because in my research, I saw, well, if someone got caught up on Tinder, well, they just hopped to Bumble, exactly. right? And they were just hopping from one platform to the next, still doing the same thing. Or in Pittsburgh, Hinge. <laughs> Hinge. <laughs> but still doing the same thing. And so I'm like, oh, this is very similar. Like, people are just using platforms to do it. So if we talked across platforms, maybe we could get people, predators specifically, off these platforms sooner without it being, well, we don't know if it's true because it's a he said, she said. Like, no, we have a lot of evidence now. So that was my proposal, was that they create an internal um, safety procedure, safety policy, maybe safety center um, across apps That's so nice. that they're able to better communicate, um, have more resources when it comes to these safety things. 
and also be able to say, hey, this person is doing the same thing on my platform. Absolutely, because okay. it's an industry. Dating yeah. is an industry. And if the government cannot, you know, preclude this type of um, a harming situations yeah. with a soft rule among themselves, they can protect. Yeah, and I thought it would be good because, one, I don't believe dating apps want to be regulated by the government. Exactly. Um, and two, um, when I was doing my research, I stumbled across the International Marriage Brokerage Act. Um, which is an act created by the United States government when, I don't know the political correct way to say this, but mail order brides were like a huge thing, right? And people were, Americans were getting their brides from overseas. And minors usually. And two women, I believe, were killed, right? So the government created the International Marriage Brokerage Act, which essentially made it, you had to disclose like the background. Absolutely. So yeah. that you knew like this person has a history of domestic violence. You you knew these things, right? So a disclosure of this information um, to protect individuals coming over. And now I believe it was part of the like the inner, the immigration process. That's how they got that in. Um, but Things like that made me think like, well, the government can regulate it. How they regulate it, I don't know. But because they, you know, regulated international marriage brokerage, this is something they could probably regulate as well. But I don't think... Um, it will be done too soon. It will be done too soon. And I don't think the companies want it done anytime soon uh, because it's probably going to... It will hit their profits. Exactly. So if we can make it attractive to them to do it internally... Why not? Yep. Again, a wonderful, innovative way of thinking and Thank finding you. a solution. Thank you. Because that's that, the way. That solution was hard. <laughs> that solution Thank you, Uber hard. and Lyft. Appreciate you. Absolutely. And uh, this type of dialectical thinking I'm always impressed with and interdisciplinary and finding solutions in one area to the other. I want to give a shout out to one of my students, Jordan who just uh, came up with a solution for climate change litigation from sports litigation. Oh. So it's amazing. Yeah. So th because of professors like you, our students here at Duquesne, I believe will be able to find innovative solutions. Yeah, you gotta have some problems. out of the box thinking Yes. Um, when it comes to creating solutions because sometimes the law just isn't there yet. It yeah. hasn't caught up. Absolutely. So can't it hasn't caught up to modern technology. Exactly. So. And the problems appear usually before the solution. Yeah. So thank you so much for okay. that also. Moving along to uh, question five. What are the main ideas before the uh, piece you, you told us? Now, questions, uh, would you like to add something or? No, I think I've talked about, I've hit all the main ideas in that piece. Thank you so very much. So question six, what does it add to the existing body of literature in this field in addition to being innovative? <laughs> so the thing that it adds is a lot of the uh, articles that I read were really well thought out, um, all talked about the background of dating, um, Section 230 generally. We've all agreed that like this shouldn't really apply to the situation, but it does. Um, but a lot of them talked about, you know, in creating, making background checks a thing right? Requiring dating apps to do background checks. And um, I agree that maybe they should, but the costs usually is going to be a lot, right. especially yeah. when um, a lot of dating apps are free. You have a lot of ads, but they're free for usage. So if they had to do these background checks on every single user, then that cost will be passed on most likely to their users, right? So when I did my deep dive into regulation and how regulation works, that was one of the key things is that when we increase the costs of things, then those costs usually aren't the burden of the company, but there's the burden of their users. customers. So I was like, well, that kind of makes it hard, hard, right? And will make certain people unable to even use the apps exactly. because they can't pay the costs. So I think background checks are a thing. I just think we need to figure out how to do it efficiently. Um, because a lot of it, a lot of, that might be a follow-up <laughs> article. Um, a lot of people, you know, we have 
heavy lead feet. And so a lot of our background check might just be traffic tickets, right? So how do you find um, the violent offender, the person who may engage in the stalking and harassing exactly. that you're trying to avoid? I don't, I'm not sure how you do that. And then the other thing that I found were people advocating for um, government regulations. And I also think that's a great way, but I think it's a slower way. Absolutely. So my way um, of thinking was that if we can just get it straight to the business, Absolutely. it'll be a quicker way to innovate safety procedures versus waiting for the government, um, waiting for them to want to spend the money on background checks. This was a, another path. Um, is it the best path? I don't think so. I really do think the government should step in and do something. But um, I think it will probably be the most efficient path right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for being innovative and having thought about all these angles in order to achieve the result that you want. Thank you. Moving along, seventh, the seventh question. How do you think the publication of our article has affected your teaching and scholarship so far? Um, I think it's affected my teaching and scholarship thus far with, I, I understand my students' angst, their anxiety when it comes to writing, their anxiety when it comes to being judged, you know, when you write a piece of work, especially as I like to call myself an emerging scholar, um, I, I think when you do that, you're on edge. You don't want to be judged, right? And I teach legal writing. So all I'm doing is editing and providing feedback, judging my um, students. So when they're having anxiety, when they're having doubts, I 100% relate to them and can take a step back and say, okay, it's okay. Tell me what you're doubting. Tell me what you're thinking. And when they have out of the box ideas that don't necessarily align with how I envisioned the assignment, I now can say, okay, walk me down the road of how you got that idea and why you want to make that argument. And right? you are more willing to accept it. I'm willing, yes, I'm way more willing to accept it. Like, okay, that out of the box thinking, it will serve you well one day and I'm not going to stifle it right now. I'm not. That's not my goal as a professor. I'm going to nurture it. So let's figure out how we can incorporate your thought process into the assignment and still make it great. So I think that has helped me a whole lot and again, as I said earlier, um, my scholarship, what I write about is really inspired my, by my students and their questions, right? And because it's inspired by them, I think by doing the research, by getting involved and doing the writing, it's helping me just become a better teacher because I'm, I'm trying to gear everything towards, yes, this is what you need to know for the practice of law. And I'm not going to take those things away because I want you to be an effective um, lawyer, but hey, what do you do when the law isn't a hundred percent on your side? Um, how do you think out of the box to change things, make social changes, right? Wow, I think we heard our audience sighing, and I'm sighing with them because it's so deep and so well thought. And um, yes, this is what we want. How do we create ethical lawyers who can think out of the box? So thank you for helping us do that. Try. I think this is going to be one of the most downloaded uh, recordings. All right. So, um, uh, and we are keeping it going further, further up in terms of interest for our audience. Thank you, Musa. Mm -hmm. The eighth question is, what are you working on right now, if you don't mind sharing with us? Okay, so I'm a little ambitious right now. Good, good. Um, so I'm working on several things. Someone told me that this is a very good year for you. I, I, I'm trying to make it a great year. <laughs> so uh, I'm working on several things at the moment. So first, um, as I mentioned before, um, students have talked to me a lot about, you know, giving back to their communities and how they can be effective lawyers when some things just don't align. And so... My first paper that I'm trying to get out, hopefully I'll get out this year, fingers crossed, is on legal writing and writing persuasively. How do you write persuasively when the law is not on your side? And a lot of the times when we focus on writing in general or when we talk about cases, we focus on um, the main opinion, right? Um, the majority opinion. 
And it's not really until you get to con law after your first year that you truly get into the weeds with the sense mm -hmm. and the impact of the sense on shaping things, right? And so I did a lot of research. There is tons out there from really, really, really great writers um, about the use of dissent to be, be persuasive. So I like that. Um, I also did a ton of research on um, the use of creative opinions. So not necessarily the dissent, but how the judge is writing the opinion, um, showing that, hey, I have to rule this way because the law says this, but, but I don't like it. <laughs> right. So create these are creative opinions and things of that nature. Um, the use of social science. So my paper really focuses on um, the why, which is I looked at big change, um, opinions that change the law in big ways. So Roper v. Simmons, um, Brown v. Board of Education. Um another one I forgot I have four that I'm looking at and I'm looking at the opinions that the judge wrote and then I'm looking at the briefs that were written and what tools that they utilize in those briefs and then how the opinions were also like snapshots the briefs. exactly reflecting the arguments reflecting reflecting the briefs and what you see is out of the box thinking is needed right and a lot of students zone in a lot on like the majority opinion and they don't think outside of that or they zone in on the statute and what the statute says and how the courts have said the statute should be interpreted which you know that's your start yes. but you don't they don't think outside of those things and I mean I was a lawyer I understand why you don't think outside of those things because you want to win yes but, but big win may be a little bit down the road exactly and um I remember just watching The Road to Brown and the movie, The Road to Brown, and that was what it showed you, right? Is that, yeah, you may lose today or you might have a small win. It seems so in insignificant, but your big win is right down the road because you're making these small little minor steps, these little cases that to you right now may not be like, oh, this is a super great thing, but it will have a big impact down the road. And I think I'm inspired by Professor Bynum. I know you retired, but Professor Bynum uh, from North Carolina Central, she inspired this because she used to say all the time that a lawyer is either a parasite on society or a social engineer. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is the article that I'm writing because of that. So a combination of my students saying, hey, Community activism is what I want to be uh, be about. And then my former property teacher having that always be one of her things. Her other one was words are the tools of our trade. So all those things, her saying that readily all the time um, spurred that article. My other article is inspired. I have to stop yeah. for a moment because in climate change litigation, we need professors like you telling the students you have to think out of the box. We are losing at every single step because no one, no practitioner in climate change litigation is willing to think like you. We cannot have judges and justices dismiss cases for lack of immediacy. Mm -hmm. We have to think about causation in different ways. Yeah. We have to think out of the box. Yeah. So thank you so much for, you know, planting the seeds yeah. in the mind of the students at, at every, in every single area of law. We have reached a position where we are just thinking in terms of 1789, 1776, I'm sorry, I, I, I use the French Revolution, but it's, it's not what we can do anymore in the 21st century. I cannot applaud you. Sorry for this. Yeah, I couldn't yeah. stop. It's amazing being here and having this discussion with you. And then my next papers, one is inspired by a student. Um, my student asked me to do a director research. And I was like, sure, you know, I'll do a director research. But the topic was super interesting. And I kind of just like fell in love with the topic. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to fall in love with the topic, but it was super interesting. And it was about the use of rap lyrics as evidence because of the current trial occurring in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm currently working with, with a student 
um, to really do a deep dive into. Please tell us about it. So I'm a bit afraid you are not TP Gore, correct? You are not going to criminalize. No, no, no. Oh, robbers. Okay, you so, got scared for a moment. No, no, no. <laughs> so it's more so is how are we using them, right? Okay. So um, rap lyrics are artistic expression. Yes. Right. And exactly. so how are we using them? Thank you, hearsay. Are we use, using them as the truth of the matter inserted, right? Because sometimes we over embellish when we talk. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So um, we're really just doing a deep dive into seeing how have they been used in the past? And if there, we're very much so in the beginning stages, if there is a method that is better, right? A method that doesn't criminalize the artistic expression. Exactly. But really shows that, hey, there is a clear nexus between what you said and the action, they align, and there are other evidence outside of just this rap lyric, right? Give us an example, please. Right now, I'm afraid I'm going to be on the other side from you, and I don't want that. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have an exact example, but what I'm thinking more so, again, this is the very beginning stages, so I don't I'm not advocating for the use of rap lyrics to criminalize anybody. Exactly. Um, but if there is other evidence that you committed the crime, right? This and, may be a, a, a proof of your state of mind. Exactly. If there is other evidence out there that you did it. Not the rap lyrics by themselves. Exactly. But there's other evidence out there that you did it. And then maybe you boasted about doing it in your lyrics. And I can see that Absolutely. connection, then yes. But if this is the basis for your claim, I don't think so. Excellent. So that, that's my current thought process. But again, I don't know yet because this is the very beginning stages. I don't think I can argue with that because we, we do write what we are very passionate about. And if I write something and then tomorrow I go and do it, yeah, it's going to be hard to say that I didn't mean it. So we're figuring don't like figuring that, that out. whatever. We're figuring that one out. Persuasive. We're figuring that one out. I, I love it. I love it. You absolutely. I right. don't want people again. What is going on in Atlanta? Tell us. So currently, <laughs> the rapper Young Thug. I don't know his actual. I can't think of his actual name right now. No, his, who cares? His yeah, government name um, is on on trial for I believe it's recall charges. Um, yeah. So they're extracting parts of his lyrics and talking about them during the trial. Um, yeah. So so it's very, very actual what you're saying. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it has to be. Uh, I, I just applaud your integrity and the type of research you're doing. So I'm sure that you are going to get to the bottom of it. And then my last article stems from an article that I actually wrote for Duquesne Law Review. Um, on the student for fair admissions right. um, Supreme Court case from last Absolutely. year, June of last year. Um, Controversial. Yes. So I'm doing a deep dive now into what has happened since, right? So student for fair admissions occurred. Um, the opinion was released June 29th, 2023. And since then, um, there have been several other lawsuits. All right. Um, so lawsuits suing law firms and corporations for their diversity-based programming. Um, law lawsuits suing nonprofits for their diversity-based grant giving. So uh, I've been looking at that. And then also, even before the... Um, Supreme Court case, there were a lot of DEI bans going on. Several of them have passed in the recent months. Um, I think one of the southern states just passed one. Um, I don't want to get it wrong. I believe it was like Alabama, Arkansas just passed one. Um, so thinking about that, those things. And that also stems from students because they were talking about the Crown Act and how the Crown Act was passed by the federal government. Some states have implemented their own Crown Acts, but yeah. We are at um, uh, in a moment of crisis as a society. If we are doubting that um, diversity is a problem. And again, I, I connected with, um, you know, climate change, environmental law. So if 
ecological diversity, we can agree upon that. Why can't we agree socially on diversity? But we are not doing too well in preserving endangered species either. So I think we have to go on from every single angle and ensure that uh, it's in our benefit, no matter what the color of our skin or culture, if we can have diversity. It's just a principle of life. So that's the... That's, that's hard. So like I said... We're not going for the easy task. Very ambitious right now. Very ambitious, and I applaud you for that, <laughs> because we need young voices, ambitious voices to... I don't know, to put those nine people who are becoming the kings of this um, democracy on the straight and narrow. We want to keep this democracy and uh, not change it for the worse. So I applaud you. Thank you. Moving along. Um, <laughs> so I know what you're working on. And I would like to know, if possible, what you would like to work on next when you're done with these very ambitious projects. When you have a moment, if you have a moment. But <laughs> um, I don't think you'd like to relax. I'm so. not sure what I would like to work on next. Um, there have been ideas that I've had aha moments about that I've written down. Um, but like the next thing, I don't know. These three are likely going to keep me super busy this coming year um, because I'm trying to like churn them out, get one out in August, another one out in February. So I'm trying to keep it out there. Um, so I don't actually know. You're open. I, to I'm very, very, very much so open. Um, however, generally speaking, um, my topics tend to deal with how the law impacts marginalized groups. So if like SCOTUS takes out another opinion. I might have my next topic. Scholars, please just do something nice for Marisa so she won't have to write that hard. <laughs> oh, I love that. So um, we are getting closer to our um, to the end of our discussion. And I have to say that uh, I feel bad for bringing it to a closure. So uh, what would you like to share with your students? as a final thought? My final thoughts, are you asking my final thoughts when it comes to scholarship or? So um, anything that you have to, um, that you would like to share with them. So you are very much um, uh, an engaged uh, citizen and uh, you are very much uh, focused on the community and you're very much focused on the a future of your students. And um, I um, I applaud you for being so committed, not only to teaching, but scholarship for how to become a better professor. So what would you like them to remember you when they, when they go out there and um, become their own masters as attorneys, making money, making a living and trying to be ethically engaged? So one, one of the things that I do, if you've ever had me in your, as a first year law professor, um, they know this, is that I do quotes of the day. I begin my classes with quotes of the day. And sometimes the quotes are connected to something we're going over in class. Sometimes it's a quote that a student has given me um, to give the class, maybe an upper level student or even a student in my class. But um, I always end the year with my own personal mantra which is progress, not perfection. I have always been a slight overachiever <laughs> um, growing up. And, you know, I always feel like, you know, when my students come to me, we're our own worst critics, right? Um, so when they come to me, I try not to add to anything that they may be thinking <laughs> about their writing, their work. So taking baby steps is okay, right? Um, you may not be the top of the class, but I'm graduate. You're going to make it, right? Um, these baby steps help you become who you are. And as I also tell my students, is that we learn more from our failures than we do our successes. Absolutely. And because of that, just remember that everything you're doing is progress, right? Each year of law school is progress towards our law degree. 
when you get into core comps, hopefully my three L's take it, <laughs> um, that is progress to making sure that you pass the bar exam, right? And then each job that you have over the course of your legal career, even if you just stay in one, it's progress into you becoming who you want to be as an attorney, right? What path you want to be, you want to take, um, and how you visualize yourself as an attorney. And um, as long as we keep progressing, we're good. That is my thought process. As long as you keep progressing forward, you're good. Even if there's little stumbles along the way, you'll be fine. It's just when we try to obtain perfection, it's when we go crazy. So progress, not perfection, is always the key. I would like to take this moment and uh, thank you all for being here. And um, I, um, I I believe that uh, as long as we have um, professors like Professors Meredith around, we're going to be okay. And as long as we can get her to come and talk to us, the library will be okay. So thank you so much for today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, it may be that this is the last um, uh, talk series for the year, or it may be that we will have one more. But um, thank you again to all of us, uh, to all our faculty members who wanted to participate. This is Dana Nakshu from uh, Duquesne Klein Law Library. Have a nice day.